All right. So we've talked about mutations, uh, what's sometimes called vertical gene transfer, where you have random, usually, errors that occur during genetic replication. Most of those errors are non-functional or don't do anything, but occasionally some of them will break a gene, and very occasionally they'll actually change how a gene functions in a useful way. And this is where most of the genetic diversity in bacteria comes from. However, there is another way that genetic diversity can spread throughout a bacterial population. It doesn't just happen by passing things to your progeny, right? So say this bacteria here has a mutation, right? And it becomes a new strain. We're gonna call it the blue strain. Then its progeny are also gonna be blue bacteria, but it's possible that you have bacteria in a population where some new piece of DNA can be transferred directly to it, causing a genetic change, which is then inherited by its offspring. And that is horizontal gene transfer. There are three main mechanisms of horizontal gene transfer that I'm going to talk to you about. First is transformation. Now this is a classic experiment. This is actually one of the first experiments that showed that DNA was the genetic material. Um, and we've talked a little bit about this before. So remember that there is two strains of uh, strap pneumoniae. Uh, one strain is what's called the smooth strain. And if you take the smooth strain and you inject it into some mice, the mice die, right? Not only do they die, but if you culture their blood, you find smooth strain bacteria in it, which makes sense. Then there's the rough strain. If you inject that into mice, the mice get the sniffles a little bit, but ultimately they typically survive. And if you culture their blood, you don't find any bacteria because their immune system fought off the bacteria. Now, we know that the difference between smooth and rough is the presence of a capsule. But hold on, because I'm getting there. They didn't know this at the time. So that's cool. You've got living, smooth, kills mice dead. Live, rough, mice don't care. Okay, so what if you take the smooth bacteria and kill them? All right? so you boil the things, they're dead. Well, if you inject mice with dead bacteria, they don't care, right? The mice survive, the bacteria was dead, the bacteria is dead, it can't replicate. So if you culture the blood, you don't find any bacteria in the mouse. So this is safe, this is safe. Theoretically, if you mix them together, you would think that it would be safe, right? You take this live rough strain, which is harmless, and you take dead smooth strain, which is harmless, and you just mix them together, and then you inject the mice with that, guess what, the mice die. Not only do the mice die, but if you culture their blood, you find live smooth strain bacteria. So they did this experiment and they said, wow, something is going on here to transform bacteria. Even after they're dead, heat killed, right? There is some thing, some element, which is capable of transforming rough into smooth. 
some lingering trait which survives the death of, of the bacteria and which is capable of transforming the live rough strain into smooth strain that then kill the mouse. Now, we know that that element is DNA. Even if you kill the cells, right, the DNA is still floating around there. The DNA by itself cannot hurt you. But if that DNA somehow gets inside a new bacteria, you can get horizontal gene transfer. Whatever about that original cell that was dangerous may be absorbed by a new cell, which will then learn how to do those things. So in transformation, we have the horizontal transfer of genetic information through a naked DNA intermediate. What that means is that DNA is just floating around being all DNA-ish. So let's say that you have two strains of bacteria, right? And I call this the blue strain, and I'm going to call this the black strain for now, all right? The blue strain dies. And when it dies, its genome starts to degrade. It fragments into pieces. But it doesn't just immediately stop existing, right? So little pieces of the, uh, of the genome are gonna be left. So we're gonna follow one little piece of the genome and we're gonna say that this piece contains the blue gene, right? Well, some cells are what we call competent. Competence is the ability of a cell to take up naked DNA from the environment. They basically scavenge around when they see some naked DNA. When they see some DNA out there, they just go, eh, maybe it's useful. <laughs> Suck it in. Some bacteria are naturally competent. They naturally take up DNA from just floating around. But while some bacteria are naturally competent, almost any bacteria can be forced into competence in a laboratory setting. Now, bacteria only replicate circular DNA. So if we stopped here, like, yeah, maybe this is cool and all, but when this bacteria divides, it has no way of replicating that linear DNA. There's a mechanism called homologous recombination, where um, you probably studied it in intro bio, and you probably called it like crossing over there. It's a thing that happens during uh, meiosis in eukaryotes. But basically what it means is that similar strands of DNA, they don't have to be identical, they just have to be similar, can kind of splice and rearrange themselves. So if this strand of DNA here has some similarity, say it comes from the same species of bacteria, you can have two crossing over or recombination events that splice the new DNA in and a portion of the old DNA out. Now, this blue DNA has been permanently incorporated into the genome and can be replicated. That's transformation. Um, now that's one way that transformation can work. And in this case, we've moved DNA from the genome of a donor cell to the genome of a reciprocal cell or a recipient cell. Uh, and so we had genomic transfer. It's also possible, remember plasmids? Plasmids are extra genomic DNA, right? It's possible for transformation to happen by means of a plasmid as well. It's actually much easier and more common. Here we have 
a, D, uh, a cell that has a plasmid of some sort. That cell dies. All right? But the plasmid is left over. It's small enough that it doesn't get fragmented. It's now just floating around in wherever. A competent cell can just absorb the plasmid, and now it's got the plasmid. And whatever genetic information was on that plasmid, fertility or uh, antibiotic resistance or whatever, is possessed by the new cell. Now, keep, keep an eye here because the donor cell died. Not a good day for the donor cell. The recipient cell survives. So that's the first mechanism of horizontal gene transfer, transformation, where DNA is transferred via naked DNA just floating around and a competent cell that can absorb naked DNA. Second, transduction. Transduction is horizontal gene transfer where the genetic material is transferred by means of a viral intermediate. And there are two types of transduction, generalized and specialized. And this is why I wanted to talk about viruses a little bit before I got into this. So if you'll recall, there are two types of viruses, virulent and uh, temperate. Virulent phages all do the lytic cycle. Temperate phages can do either the lytic or lysogenic cycle. And we're gonna see that that makes a difference. In generalized transduction, you have a phage that undergoes the lytic cycle. So it could be either virulent or temperate. It attaches, inserts its genome, and then just does the normal lytic cycle, right? It expresses a bunch of viral proteins. It degrades the bacterial genome and then it's going to assemble a bunch of viruses. But biology isn't perfect. Sometimes it makes mistakes. And so in this case, a piece of bacterial DNA was accidentally inserted. So like most of the viruses got viral DNA, but one of the viruses or a couple of viruses accidentally got bacterial DNA stuck in them. So then you have release, and this virus that had bacterial DNA in it goes and finds another bacteria, attaches, penetrates, inserts the genomic DNA, but that's not viral DNA, so it's not going to hurt the cell. Instead, just like before, it can undergo homologous recombination, splice itself into the genome. And now this recipient cell has got some new information that was given to it by this virus. This is called generalized transduction because it can transfer any portion of the bacteria's genome. Like which bit of DNA is accidentally inserted into a virus is totally random. So it could be any gene or whatever portion of the genome. Specialized transduction requires a temperate host or a temperate virus undergoing the lysogenic cycle. So here we have our virus, right? It lands, inserts its genome. That genome then splices itself into the bacterial chromosome through a process called non-homologous recombination. Uh, that doesn't require as much similarity. So it's much more, you know, it, it can insert at a specific place 
but it doesn't require huge long sections of chromosome similarity. But there are only certain places in the genome where it can splice itself into. That's going to be important. So boom, it splices itself into the genome. It becomes a prophage. Okay? Yada, yada, yada. It reproduces a whole bunch. Eventually, it's going to splice itself back out. But in this case, again, it makes a mistake. Instead of splicing out just the viral DNA, it leaves a little bit of viral DNA behind and grabs a little bit of bacterial DNA. You see that little blue bit there? It accidentally grabbed that. Now we're going to build a whole bunch of viruses. They're all going to get this genome piece that has a little bit of bacterial DNA. Cell dies, virus goes off to a different cell, and then it reinserts itself. And when it does, it's taken a little bit of bacterial DNA from this first cell to this recipient cell. And because it left behind some of the viral DNA, it, it's probably stuck, right? But viruses don't have a lot of spare info, right? They need almost every gene that they have in order to do their thing. So if it left behind a chunk of viral DNA, it's probably non-functional when it gets where it's going. So this cell has now been lysogenically converted by this new bacterial DNA. This is called specialized transduction because you'll note that only certain genes can be transferred, right? You can't transfer like a gene from over here or a gene from over here. You're gonna only transfer genetic material that is near the site of prophage insertion. Third type of horizontal gene transfer is conjugation. Now the first two types, the donor cell died. In transformation, the donor cell dies, spills its DNA out there, something else picks up the DNA, right? In transduction, right, the donor cell is infected by a virus, the virus kills the donor cell, and then takes some of its DNA with it when it leaves. This is the only type, conjugation is the only type of horizontal gene transfer where the donor cell remains alive. And we've already kind of talked about how conjugation in its base form works. So we have a bacterial cell that has an F plasmid, a fertility plasmid, that teaches it how to make a pillus. We call this an F plus cell because it has the F plasmid, and this is an F minus cell. In conjugation, we're going to grow a pillus between the two cells. The plasmid will replicate by rolling circle replication. The DNA is transferred through the pillus where it assembles itself into a circle on the other side and its second strand is made. This recipient cell now has an F plasmid and becomes F plus. The pillus is broken and the two cells go their separate way. Now here's the thing. This only transfers plasmid DNA. Right? And usually F plasmids in their natural state only contain the genes necessary for doing conjugation. So, like the new cell hasn't learned anything super useful, it's just learned how to spread its plasmid. Now let's get a little bit more sophisticated here. Plasmids just like viral genomes, can sometimes be inserted into bacterial genomes. So here we have an F plasmid 
and it gets spliced in to the bacterial chromosome by non-homologous recombination. And again, it can be spliced back out. Sometimes when that happens, it makes a mistake. So you can see that this plasmid has grabbed a little bit of bacterial DNA. We now call this an F prime plasmid. It's a fertility plasmid that has extra DNA. Now we got the same thing that happens before. We make a pillus. Cro uh, plasmid replicates by rolling circle replication. Reforms itself in the new cell. But now this new cell has a little bit of extra bacterial DNA that has been transferred to it. So it p potentially could have gotten some new information. And we have genome transfer. The pillus is broken, and the F prime plasmid is transferred. Now there's one more thing that can happen. So some uh, bacteria contain a mutation called the HFR mutation. It stands for high frequency of recombination. Uh, with the HFR mutation, basically the plasmid is jumping in and out and in and out and in and out of the genome. That's the high frequency of recombination. It jumps in, it jumps out, it jumps in, it jumps out. So that's going to lead to a higher likelihood of a, an F prime plasmid forming. But also, what if you try to transfer the plasmid, you try to do conjugation while the plasmid is inside the chromosome? right? It's still got all of the tools for doing its normal thing, right? So in this case, we're going to make a, a uh, pillus between the two. And the entire chromosome or part of the chromosome is going to try to replicate itself through rolling circle replication and go through the pillus. So let's see that again. All right. So we have our, uh, our, our, our plasmid integrated into the chromosome. And we're going to peel away a long portion of the genome and that whole portion of the genome is going to get transferred. Now, in reality, genomes are big compared to plasmids. Um, almost never do the two bacteria stay connected for long enough for the entire genome to be transferred. Usually the genome gets like partway through and then something happens that breaks the pillus. And what you get is part of the genome transferred. But even then, that whole part of the genome that's transferred can splice itself into the chromosome. And here you can get huge numbers of genes, like thousands of base pairs transferred all at once. It always starts from the plasmid insertion site. But it usually starts from the middle, so you only take half the plasmid. So this cell will actually end up staying F minus. Because it only got half of the plasmid. But it can gain a whole new set of genes. And this is now a partial diploid. which can lead to some really interesting things happening. Okay, so those are the three main mechanisms 
of uh, horizontal gene transfer, I want you to think about what would prevent each of those forms of horizontal gene transfer, All right? So, for instance, uh, say that um, you have two cells and you know that genetic transfer is happening between them, but you don't know how. And you find out that if you put a barrier between the cells so that they can't actually touch, genetic transfer stops. Then you know the genetic transfer is happening by conjugation. Because conjugation requires cell-to-cell -cell contact. If you stop the cell-to-cell -cell contact, you stop the transfer of genes. Well, you know it was happening by cell-to-cell -cell contact, which is conjugation. So think about that.